hear me okay? Okay, super. Um, I think this might be maybe the most participants we've had in the session, so I'm really excited. Um, so uh, my name's Jenny Dale. I'm the Information Literacy Coordinator at the University Libraries, and I proposed this virtual learning community, or you'll hear me call it, or you'll see me write it as the ULVLC, um, as a way to promote peer learning and to build some community within our libraries during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I know many of us are working remotely. I know that's actually probably gonna increase some next week with the new stay at home order. Um, so I, I hope this project gives everyone um, an opportunity to engage with each, other, with each other and to do some learning and sharing, even though while we're all working kind of at a social distance. And again, maybe about to be even more so. So we will have archived recordings of this and all of the other um, sort of traditional discussion uh, or webinar presentations from this session up on our um, LibGuide, which I think um, Sam, will, will be, Sam will put in the chat. Uh, it's uncg.libguides.com slash ULBLC. That is where you can see what we have coming up. We have something every day next week again. Uh, and we also uh, do have other information about how you can submit an idea, who you can get in contact with, and how you can sign up. So uh, I'm going to go over some basic logistics. I think we're probably all getting really good at Zoom by now. Um, but just to make sure you did come uh, in with audio already muted, everyone is uh, set to be muted, but you can unmute your audio. Um, just not, just please don't do it during the presentation because that can cause some feedback. Um, there will be different um, points in the webinar where you can, well, Claire will be able to answer questions. Please feel free to put questions in the chat. Um, again, there will be some opportunities for you if you want to use your microphone and either ask questions or uh, kind of engage with, with each other later. But during the presentation, please enter any questions you have using the chat feature. Um, if there are any technical issues, feel free to put those in the chat or email Sam. Um, she can guide you through some solutions. Her email is slharlow at uncg.edu. Um, and so before I introduce our presenter for today, um, please let me know if anyone has any questions. Oh, I also want to remind you, I forgot to say this. Um, if you have any kind of major uh, major tech situations. Yeah, thanks, Sam. We are recording the session. So if something happens where you're like, oh, no, my audio went out and I can't figure out why, um, you will be able to view the session later. As you can see, it's already being recorded. All right, I don't see any questions coming in. So I will introduce our speaker today. Today's session is being hosted by Claire Heckel, the People Not Property Project Coordinator in ARIT. Uh, Dr. Heckel will be presenting on the Digital Library on American Slavery, and she's specifically going to be talking about ways to get involved with the People Not Property Project. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Claire, um, and I want to thank all of you for participating, and I want to thank especially Claire for presenting. So Claire, take it away. Thanks, Jenny, and hi, everybody. Thanks for being here remotely, and thank you, Sam and Jenny, for setting up this opportunity for me to share um, what we're doing in ERIT with People Not Property. Uh, this has been added as one of the projects that people can contribute to remotely. All of the work is online, as you'll see. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Digital Library on American Slavery, and then more specifically about People Not Property, Slave Deeds of North Carolina and opportunities for involvement along with a little bit of general instruction for how to get started. Um, I will give these PowerPoint slides to Sam and Jenny after the session as a PDF, so you guys can refer back to those later. The Digital Library on American Slavery is a project that grew out of um, history professor Lauren Schwessinger's work on archiving documents related to the history of slavery. Um, Richard Cox and David Gwynn have been heading up and organizing this major initiative that includes the Race and Slavery Petitions Project, the Runaway Slave Advertisements Project, 
um, and people not property. The transatlantic slave trade database is also linked to in the Digital Library on American Slavery or the DLAS, uh, but that's a project out of Emory University. The Race and Slavery Petitions Project is legal documents, court cases mostly related to enslaved persons, slaveholders, and free people of color. It includes names of more than 150,000 individuals extracted from close to 3,000 legislative documents and 14,500 county court petitions. So this has names of roughly 80,000 slaves, 8,000 free people of color, and 62,000 uh, white people, primarily slaveholders. It's national in scope, and users can search by name, date range, state, keyword, or browse by subject. There's also a glossary of terms and a help with searching feature. Some examples of the kinds of documents that um, are found in the Race and Slavery Petitions Project include a petition to the courts from 1831. So this is just after the Nat Turner Slave Rebellion in Virginia, where 80, 87 residents of Lenore County are seeking to exclude all colored retailers of cakes, spirits, et cetera, from its limits, except those licensed by the county court. They're convinced that the free Negroes and slaves hiring their time from adjoining counties have not only produced serious loss and inconvenience by the temptations which are thus held out to their slaves, uh, but also firmly aware that said persons do far more serious and incalculable injury, basically by spreading seditious writings and notions. So they're, they specifically make reference to communicating verbally the murderous plans of Nat Turner. So we can get ideas both about what's going on with the enslaved population and the mentality of slaveholders at the time. Uh, similarly, there's a petition from Sampson County around 1830 saying that enslaved people are becoming uncontrollable. Uh, they say they're fleeing into the woods, many of them to the Great Dismal Swamp, that they are stealing cattle and hogs and sheep. Um, and a lot of these smaller rebellions are undocumented historically, so the petitions are one of the few ways we have to gain insights into them. Another uh, issue that pops up frequently, and here's one from Guilford County um, involving the Quakers and their manumission society, they were regularly petitioning the courts to register objections to the institution of slavery and to um, petition for its uh, abolition. So just as an overview, this is the browse subjects. Uh, researchers can browse issues including um, attempts to attain freedom, the activities of free people of color, cases of crime and punishment, family, migration. The next um, item in the DLAS is the North Carolina Runaway Slave Ads Project. This includes images of all known runaway slave ads published in North Carolina newspapers from 1751 to 1841, and this project is ongoing, so it will go up to 1865. It includes contextualizing essays and an annotated bibliography to aid researchers and a searchable database. The ads are very interesting because they include some of the most detailed descriptions that we get of uh, freedom seekers or runaway slaves, um, especially concerning their appearance, their dress and clothing, as well as personality traits. So whether they're boisterous or soft spoken, things like that, literacy, trades and other skills, um, as well as languages, which can indicate where and how recently they came from, as well as slaveholders' attitudes, common routes of escape, and strategies of escape. Um, a couple of examples that have stood out to me in looking at these materials, uh, there's a description of several freedom seekers running away who were recently arrived from Africa. One is described as having his teeth filed and his country marks on his face. This is a reference to facial scarification and teeth filing. This is a much later photo of some men from the Congo 
uh, with these modifications that were both beauty conventions and signs of tribal membership. In another ad, uh, an enslaved person named Jacob is described as having been heard by the overseer to throw out some hints that all should be free and that he saw no reason why the sweat of his brow should be expended in supporting the extravagance and idleness of any man or some words to that effect. Uh, he goes on to say that he thinks that he's going to preach this to other enslaved people wherever he goes and that it should become uh, the business of everyone to recapture this dangerous person with these dangerous principles regarding freedom. The transatlantic slave trade database is a massive project uh, that has documented at this point 36,000 slaving expeditions that took place between 1514 and 1866. There are a lot of interactive maps and data tables as well as essays and um, some great images for teaching purposes. It also includes the intra-American slave trade database. So this would be slave voyages going between uh, Brazil or the Caribbean and the United States, which is where a lot of the enslaved people who entered the United States were coming from, as well as an African names database, um, personal details of 90,000 Africans taken from captured slave ships or from African trading sites. So this could include their names, ages, genders, origins, um, and places where they embarked and disembarked. Um, so as this map shows, the proportion of the slave trade that was coming to North America was very small compared to Brazil and the Caribbean. Uh, People Not Property is the latest addition to the DLAS. It's a three-year initiative funded by the National Archives um, Historic Records and Publications Commission to digitize, transcribe property deeds related to enslaved people and create a searchable database. So slave deeds are basically property deeds that include information about enslaved people. Um, this information can be very general, but it can also include names and ages and even family relationships between enslaved people. Slave deeds have been documented by several registers of deeds offices. Uh, Buncombe County, Surrey County, Iredell, and Guilford are a few that have um, undertaken independently finding these uh, documents. So as the Guilford County Register of Deeds website says here, finding this information can be like finding a needle in a haystack because the slave deeds are handwritten um, and they are mixed in with what is mostly property deeds, so land deeds. So the bulk of the work is reading through all of these handwritten land deeds to identify the ones that mention enslaved people. The counties that are currently participating in this first three-year segment of the project are shown here. Hopefully, we'll get to expand the project to include the entire state. And we're working on building connections across the different platforms of the DLAS. So this is an example of a runaway ad that mentions a woman named Lydia and a man named Jeffrey. It was posted by Archibald Campbell. And about a year later, we see a slave deed, Archibald Campbell selling several slaves to Christmas Murphy, and among them are Jeffrey and Lydia. So this is a really interesting opportunity to see the outcome of, of freedom seeking. Most runaway instances, we only have the ad and we don't really know how it turned out unless that person has been successful and told their story from the other side. Similarly, there is another instance of a man named Quacko um, who was in Brunswick County, sold in January and ran away in September. So this kind of story might indicate that, um, and we know from accounts of people who successfully sought freedom, that often being sold and separated from their loved ones was a motivation for seeking freedom. 
To come back to people, not property, we also have a Twitter and Instagram account where we post a daily deed. This example is from March 16th, 1824 in Orange County, documenting the sale of three Negroes, Harry about 24, Lucinda his wife about 20, and Green nine years old for $900 or $23,453 adjusted for inflation. We also hold community information sessions. This is an example of a flyer from a series of them that we held in Northeastern North Carolina um, that include information much like what I'm presenting to you today. The project goals are to identify, download, and index a minimum of 9,800 deeds from the participating counties. As of the beginning of January, uh, we had gotten to about a little over a quarter of that goal. So ways that you all can contribute are to locate and label deeds. This is probably the easiest, um, though the handwriting is always challenging. This is just reading through the deed books online to identify deeds that mention enslaved people. You then give each slave deed a unique document ID and download it and label it with that ID. And I'll go into each of these things in more detail presently. Indexing deeds is more detailed, more involved. Um, you would be reading through deeds that have already been downloaded and entering the information in the deed into a spreadsheet. We also have uh, several indexes that need to be updated. So the counties that created their own indexes are not in the same format as our index. So it would basically be going through PDFs or Excel files and migrating that data to a Google spreadsheet. Uh, and reformatting it and filling in missing data. I also want to point everyone toward our volunteer handbook. It's available um, at the library website slash slavery slash deeds. Um, you'll see volunteer resources on the left there and you can download the PDF volunteer handbook, which will provide some additional information. In the handbook, there's also a handwriting example. So we offer a, several deeds that we have transcribed, um, as well as a letter by letter handwriting guide. The handwriting can be the most challenging part of starting to work with these deeds, but it does get a lot easier as you go through it. Um, you kind of find a rhythm and get used to the handwriting and things start moving more quickly than they do perhaps in the beginning. So the data fields that we're looking at, instead of transcribing the deeds word for word because they are legal documents, they're pretty wordy, they're pretty repetitive, we're looking at pulling out the information that's most useful for researchers, both academic and the wider community. So this includes the type of deed, the date, the amount and currency paid, grantor, grantee, enslaved persons, and I'll be giving examples of these um, in a moment. Additional details on enslaved people, including the number of individuals, their ages, family relationships, genders, race, and this is race as it's defined in the document. And then a notes column for any information that seems interesting but doesn't really fit into our defined fields. So to define some of the types of deeds that you would encounter, um, the most common is the bill of sale. This is basically a receipt documenting the purchase of an enslaved person or people. So this is um, John, James, and William Gordon, uh, the grantors selling to the grantee, um, William Wilson for 220 pounds, one Negro woman named Let, one Negro boy five years old named Key, and one Negro girl two years old named Hannah. Um, so this example is annotated. These also appear in the volunteer handbook just as kind of an orientation to where in the documents the pertinent information tends to show up. Um, in red is indicated where we determine what kind of deed this is. So if you see the word sold, 
and an amount in currency paid, it's a bill of sale generally. Um, the second kind is a deed of gift, and this just basically documents a gift. So here, William Wycliffe is um, out of love, goodwill, and affection. That's a common term that shows up in a deed of gift. Um, has given and granted, but there's no mention of selling. There's no currency. Um, so this is to his daughter, Elizabeth Wycliffe, one Negro boy uh, called by the name Ned. And then in red below, deed of gift appears again. Another common type of deed is the deed of trust. This is really documenting collateral on a loan. So this is uh, the grantor or the indebted person, Thomas Godsey to William Love. Um, in red here, you can see the phrase stands lawfully indebted. So that's a sign that this is a deed of trust. Um, he's indebted to Robert Lindsay. So this is a third party in the sum of $250. So William Love is covering that debt for Thomas Godsey, and this deed documents that if Thomas Godsey defaults on that loan, um, two enslaved people in his ownership will revert to William Love. So unlike the bill of sale or the deed of gift, we seldom know what the result of a deed of trust was, whether this person paid off the debt or these enslaved people ended up uh, being transferred, we don't know. Um, the last will and testament, that should be a pretty familiar document to everyone. Um, they don't show up frequently in the deed books, but they do pop up every now and then. This is one from William Bradley, um, willing two Negro slaves, one man and one woman, so they are unnamed to his wife, Rachel Bradley. Partitions are the most complicated type of uh, deed. These are um, basically if someone dies intestate, they have not left a will, and there's a dispute over their property among the heirs, there are two solutions. There's the partition in kind, where the property is divided up between heirs. This is the example below. Um, where the enslaved people owned by James Clark, who is deceased, is being divided among eight of his heirs. So the deed lists each person, the enslaved people, and what they were valued at, um, as you can see below. A partition by sale would be that property gets sold and the proceeds are divided between the heirs. Another document that shows up that's not technically a slave deed, but that we are um, including in the project are apprenticeship bonds. Um, the apprenticeship bond would either detail someone entering an apprenticeship or um, being released from it. And apprenticeships were not always voluntary. They were actually mandatory for any child um, that didn't have a father. They were considered orphans or whose father was not legally recognized. Um, and any child of mixed race for a long time was actually pressed into apprenticeship um, by law. So this documents Hugh Sparrow. It mentions that he is the base or illegitimate son of Mary Sparrow, that he's a mulatto fellow aged about 33 years. Um, and this document is indicating that he has fulfilled the terms of his apprenticeship and is now free to practice as a, a free tradesman. The marriage contact, contract, um, those show up rarely, but it's kind of like a prenuptial agreement. It mostly protects the property of women who are entering a marriage. So single women and then especially married women had little to no property rights in the 18th, 19th, and much of the 20th century. Um, the marriage contract was really meant to keep the woman's property in the family so that it could be inherited by her children. Um, there are many cases in the court petitions, for example, 
where husbands have through gambling, drinking, ill-fated business ventures kind of squandered all of the property that a woman brought into a marriage and left her and her children destitute. So these documents are attempts by the families to protect the property um, that women are bringing into marriages, and this frequently includes enslaved people. Um, the final example is a writ of fieri facius. This is seizure of property following legal action. Um, so if there's a judgment against someone in court that involves financial um, payment, the sheriff or a marshal will be um, appointed by the court to seize property, sell it at public auction, and this frequently included enslaved people. Um, at this point, I'll ask if there are any questions about the types of deeds. We haven't had any come up so far in the chat, but um, if you have questions, please do go ahead and put those in the chat right now. Okay, I'll move ahead. Oh, we've got one. Okay. What do you do, Catherine asks, what do you do with documents that are damaged or the handwriting is unreadable? What we do with those is we note them. Um, so we're working off of digitized versions of microfilm um, that were completed by the Family Search Organization. The original deed books are at the state archives for the most part, or they're at the Register of Deeds offices. Um, really, as, as volunteers, you just need to know that you note like book B pages 100 through 300 are unreadable. And we'll go back to those, um, we'll go back to the originals and see if they're readable. Um, if they are, we will rescan them, uh, working with staff at the state archives. All right, awesome. Any other questions at this point? Looked like that might be the only one for now. So, um, oh, and a final one is the emancipation documents. These are unfortunately very rare, but they do show up. This is a bill of sale where a man named Fortune is basically purchasing himself from Lewis Galloway. Um, you see here in red his liberty. So it says Fortune, Negro slave of the county and state aforesaid, um, has for $400 cash uh, paid to Galloway, purchased his liberty as a slave. He is to be at liberty and freed from any bondage as a slave and has a right to act in the capacity of a free colored man. Um, this is probably the best case document that we find. So I'll move on to how you access the deeds. You would need to, you would need a Google account, which all of you of course have um, for work and a free account with familysearch.org. And then once you've signed up to participate in the project, I will provide links to the assigned books. So this kind of just shows the interface on Family Search. Um, you can view the pages, you know, several at a time or then zoom in. You can zoom in a lot further than this, but I wanted to show the whole document. Um, and you can navigate with the arrows you see at the top left. Also um, at the top right under the blue attached to family tree button, there are tools. This will allow you to adjust the brightness and contrast. Um, if you hit apply, that will apply to all the pages that you're reading. Um, and this can be very useful for images that are too light or too dark. So if you're locating and labeling deeds, you'll basically go through deed books page by page looking for words like slave and Negro that indicate that it is a slave deed. Um, this can be very time consuming at first because you'll be reading word for word. Um, as you get used to the structure of the of the deeds, you'll see that there are whole blocks of text you can kind of skip over. So once you get a sense for how they're worded and kind of the rhythm, you'll kind of 
um, focus in on where they get to the point of what they are conveying or selling. The majority of deeds will be land deeds. Those will also become pretty easily recognizable as you see more and more of them. Um, the descriptions of land boundaries are in terms of degrees and poles and they'll reference like lying next to this creek or this person's land. So generally a land deed won't include enslaved people. When you do find a slave deed, um, what you'll do is note the book and page. So you'll have, you see here, a segment of the spreadsheet. So the county, um, you can just kind of automatically populate the county field and the county code field. And then you just enter the book or volume number. This will be a number or a letter and the page. And then you construct a document ID that's basically county code dot book dot page. And then it gets a dot one if it's the first slave deed on the page. Um, and as a point of clarification, even if it's the third deed on the page, if it's the first slave deed, it's still a dot one. If there are multiple slave deeds on a page, which does rarely happen, you would then have county code dot book dot page dot two. Are there questions about this aspect? So if possible, oh, it looks like a question may have popped up. No, that was Sam saying none so far. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry about that. If possible, you would then download each image and save it as a JPEG. Um, you would save it with, um, as the document ID. So down here, the first example, uh, wake.6.5.1.jpg. Um, and I would provide you with a Google Drive folder where you could then upload all of the deeds you found um, in a given session. If the downloading and uploading for some reason isn't possible for you, you can just create the list and note that they haven't been downloaded and we can give it to one of our uh, student research assistants to do the downloading. So this is just another example of what that spreadsheet will look like during the locate and label process. So indexing goes a step beyond locate and label to the left of these fields here. And I apologize for that resolution. Um, so this would have the county book page document ID and then goes on to list document type, uh, which you would have to determine the month, day and year, the names of the grantors and grantees, the slaves listed, number of slaves, age, so the names are separated by semicolons and the age is separated by semicolons. Um, the database will then pair the names and the ages based on order. So if there isn't an age for someone, it's important that a zero go in as a placeholder. This information is covered in more detail in the volunteer handbook. And I'm also available always to answer questions. So. Um, also family, um, usually the only family relationship that's mentioned is mother and child or mother and children, as well as gender. You can ind indicate if it's male, female, or a mixed group. Um, age circa would be if it's indicated whether the person is a child or an adult, or whether the group is made up of both children and adults, and then the color or race. Um, Largely, this is listed as Negro. There are other terms um, in the drop down menu. So you'll just go with whatever is listed in the deed. And then there's both the amount and the currency. So the currency could be because this covers the colonial period as well as the later period. It could be in pounds, it could be in dollars. Um, if there is no currency, you just indicate whether it's a gift or a will or an apprenticeship bond. So for example, um, though it's blurry, the second from the last line here is that deed for Hugh Sparrow's apprenticeship bond. So the amount is zero and the currency is apprenticeship. Um, so that just indicates that there is no currency. It's another type of deed. 
uh, before I move on from indexing, are there questions about that? Again, if you have questions, please put those in the chat. Okay. For those of you who enjoy spreadsheets, um, updating existing indexes is also an option. Because all of our data needs to be in the same format to be uploaded to the central database, um, the counties that previously completed their indexes, um, th that information needs to be migrated and fleshed out a little bit. Um, this is an example, I think, from Iredell County. So you'll see that the format is very different. They've got the date in a different format. Um, they've got an individual line for each uh, enslaved person. So that's different from our format. Um, then they have the consideration. So that would be the amount and currency and the book slash page in one column. So this would basically be the first step would be taking this information and formatting it for our spreadsheet, entering it in our spreadsheet, and then noting what fields are missing and going back to the deeds. But you already have the book and page, so that makes it a lot easier to find them. Um, I would see this going in two separate phases. So first, migrate all of the information that is there, and then secondly, go back and find the missing information, which could be done by another person or by the person who's updating. Uh, a final note, and this is something we include in the volunteer handbook as well as um, any community information sessions um, that I give is on historical trauma. Reading these documents can be uh, pretty emotionally disturbing. Uh, they do document very traumatic histories. Um, and historical trauma is a recognized term for the cumulative collective effect of physical and psychological violence that affects the survivors of traumatic historical events such as slavery, genocide, and persecution. Um, I think that this can also impact people who are engaging with these histories in depth. Um, and working with these histories may cause specifically feelings of sad, sadness, hopelessness, fatigue, irritability, numbness, difficulty sleeping, nightmares, heightened sensitivity, feeling jumpy or easily startled. So I think it's just important to be aware of this, that maybe if you've been working with these materials and you find yourself being somewhat irritable, for example, um, just to understand that maybe you are feeling the effects of engaging with these stories. For those who are interested in this topic in more depth, Dr. Joy DeGray has written extensively about it, specifically with the African-American community and post-traumatic slave syndrome, a, toy, a term that she coined, America's legacy of enduring injury and healing. So she's um, addressed this extensively. What we recommend to volunteers, and I would extend this to you as well, is taking breaks from this work if you start feeling overwhelmed by it, um, talking to friends, family, or religious or spiritual advisors, exercising or going for a walk, um, meditation or prayer, anything you might find helpful if it gets a little too heavy. Um, and that taking a break could mean walking away for 10 minutes. It could mean stepping back from the project for a few days to do other work and then coming back to it um, when you feel you're able. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you all again for coming. And at this point, I think we can open it up to questions. Yeah, if people have questions. Please put those in the chat. Um, Vanessa said that the breaks help, um, which I imagine they're pretty necessary. Sarah says this is so cool. Um, Catherine asks, uh, how long on average does working on one document take? I know each document is different, so that may be a difficult answer. Um, it is a difficult answer, especially, I mean, people's reading speeds vary individually, even with typewritten documents. I've been working with handwritten historical documents for more than a decade, so I go through pretty quickly. Um, 
what I've seen with our student employees, because, you know, with our volunteers, I'm not really tracking how long things take them, but with our student research assistants, um, I am tracking how many pages they get through. Um, our faster student employees can get through about 20 pages in an hour. And that's just with the locate and label. So identifying the document and putting in that information. Um, some other people in the chat who've been working on this might have some answers as well. Uh, for example, I've heard Vanessa chime in. Uh, she and I were talking about it the other day. She said it, it did get a lot faster as she got more familiar with the deeds. Okay, a couple other things that have come up. Um, uh, Shonda recommended a book that sounds really interesting um, called, uh, called They Were Her Property, White Women as Slave Owners in the American South by Dr. Stephanie Jones Rogers. Mm -hmm. um, Vanessa said, you do start understanding the format um, and words start popping out. I, I have a question, um, Claire, how many volunteers do you have already working on this project? Or I know you may not know the exact number, but like a ballpark. Um, we have had close to 60 people register thus far. Um, but as with many projects, the people who register and then the people who are consistently working on it um, varies a lot. I would say we have about a dozen people who are actively working as volunteers. Um, and some of them are just really outstanding. We've got one man who has done pretty much all of Brunswick County on his own in the past couple of months. Um, so I think we, we have some people who pick it up, you know, here and there as they can, and some people who may be, a lot of them are retirees and active members of the African American genealogical community who are just really dedicated um, to the project. That's awesome. Wow. Yeah, I know. Um, 60 signups is great. 12 very active volunteers is also awesome. So, all right. Any other questions or comments or anything like that? I know I personally have taught with the um, runaway slave advertisements a few times in information literacy sessions but I had no idea all the connections between the different projects, and I think that's really awesome. Um, yeah, the, the ultimate goal would be to have uh, the, it set up so that you could search for terms or names and get results from across all of these different platforms, um, which would make it a lot easier to find those connections. Yeah, yeah, that's really, um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That'll be really interesting. Um, Charlie mentioned, um, after I went to the Diversity Institute, the depth of meaning of this really got to me. So my understanding is that the, the um, REI Institutes will ideally pick back up in the future when we see what the future looks like. <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. we'll see. Say people should check their website too because they may be transitioning to webinar formats for some of the things they offer. But yeah, I think one of the values of working with these documents um, is that it really humanizes a history that's often taught in very general terms. We just hear about slaves and slaveholders without names. Um, to me, especially when details come out about families being split up, about cases where a mother is being sold with some of her children to one place and other children going other places, um, you really get a much greater sense of the human tragedy, daily human tragedies involved in our country's history of slavery that really aren't conveyed much in conventional historical narrative. Um, Christine asks, have you heard stories about how genealogists are finding information about family members? Um, specific stories, 
Most of the stories I've heard have come from, so we're working closely with the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society. Um, mostly people, the most progress people are making is getting from the 1870 census to possibly finding information about enslaved family members in the deeds. Um, so the 1870 census would be the last or the first census where in formerly enslaved people are listed by name. Um, I have at their conferences seen people present on deeds that they found related to family members. Um, but thus far, because our deeds are not up online yet, we don't have any of those examples ourselves. We're hoping to get some as we put the project online. Awesome, Christine says, thank you. All right, any other questions or anything that people wanna bring up in the chat? Um, Claire, while, while I'm waiting to see if people have any more, if you could just maybe talk again, I know you've said some this a few times, but how people can, um, help out with this project like what what the procedure is in terms of like getting in touch with you or um, I would say email me uh, I should have put my email on this last um, but Jenny you can um, send out the PDF of the talk to the participants afterwards yes for sure okay so um, you could just copy me on that and we can put my email in there basically um, for UNCG employees uh, rather than registering on our volunteer website, I would just ask you to send me an email and tell me which activity you're interested in doing, whether it's locating and labeling, indexing, or um, that spreadsheet kind of management migration. Okay, excellent. I'm also going to drop, oh, Catherine asks, what would be the higher priority? And while you're thinking about that or answering that, I'm going to put your email in the chat. So if people okay. want to um, make note of it. Um, I mean, really all of it needs to be done. I think the, yeah, it really depends on people's particular strengths and interests. So we, we really need to get all of it done. Um, and I think people know which ones they could work more quickly at if that makes sense. All right, I think, and Catherine says, thanks. Yes, it does. Um, all right, I think that's all the questions. People are saying thank you. Sam dropped in the chat in case y'all didn't see it. Um, the uh, like uh, follow-up feedback all assessment. I'm struggling with my words today. It's been a lot of working from home, so. Um, but people are expressing thanks and saying great job. Um, and we also have information about our next session, um, which will be visual thinking strategies um, on uh, Monday with Maggie Murphy at 11 a.m. That's going to be a pretty interactive session where she's going to be talking about a specific uh, set of strategies called visual thinking strategies that she's being trained on. Um, and she will kind of go through uh, that so if you're interested, you know, you know where to go go to that lib guide Go to that sign up But yes, we are getting lots of excellent feedback in the chat for this session So Claire, I just want to say thank you again for doing this for us yeah, and thank you all for dropping in and yeah, 30 participants. That's awesome. I think again. I think that's the most we've had so I'm very excited. All right, y'all. Um, so, Sam, do you want to stop the recording?